Okay, good afternoon. I'm Peter Phillips from the Sociology Department here at Sonoma State. And I'm going to talk about the global power elite, um, the giants of capitalism. And you, there's a picture that you all have a copy of. And this is the Diego Rivera mural, which now resides in Mexico City, but this is the second copy of it. This mural was first done at the Rockefeller Center in 1934 by Diego Rivera, and Rockefeller didn't like it that he had certain figures in there and destroyed the entire mural. The mural is the, is a, it's called the Man of the Universe, and it seemed appropriate that one, the Rockefellers had destroyed it, and two, that uh, um, it's you know, about a very powerful person. And so that's going to be on the picture of my Global Power Elite book, which will be out in August from Seven Stories Press. Part of the conversation today, too, is about the transnational capitalist class. Estimates, estimates are that the world's wealth is about 255 trillion. And with U US and Europe holding about two thirds of that total. Meanwhile, 80% of the people in the world live on less than $10 a day. And the poorest half of the, li of the population lives on $2.50 a day. And 1.3 billion people live on $1.25 a day. So there's massive inequality and 80% of the world is very poor. The LA Times reports this year that one out of nine fed people go to bed hungry every night. That's 795 million people on the planet who suffer from chronic hunger and they forecasting the two billion people will be lacking food by 2050. In addition, one out of three people suffer from some form of malnutrition, which means they lack sufficient vitamins and minerals in their diet to lead, that lead to health issues such as stunted growth in children. Each year, poor nutrition kills 3.1 million children under the age of five. 25,000 people a day, or nine million a year, die from starvation and malnutrition. This slaughter occurs every day. That's the equivalent of 10 9-11 events every day in the world. Yet, we have more than enough people to food to feed everybody. It's not a lack of food, it's a lack of distribution. A quarter of all the food in grocery stores is thrown away. Humanity is divided into the 1%, the upper 1%, and the, particularly the upper 1,000th of 1%, several thousand people in the very elite group. 20%, which have jobs and incomes and are often described as middle class working people, professionals. And the 80%, where wealth <clears throat> really doesn't exist at all. The transnational capital elite takes pride in pointing out that the, they have the largest middle class ever, but that's the 20%, but that doesn't extend down into the rest of the world, and they are getting poorer every day. Oxfam International reported in January of 2016 that only 62 people hold as much wealth as half the world. A year later, that was down to eight people. So at the, end of, at the beginning of 2017, eight people controlled more wealth than half the world. And wealth concentration is happening so massively that someday it's very feasible that one person will hold more wealth than half the humans in the world. The top billionaires, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, who's now 100 million and, and uh, the number one leader in the world, Armancia Ortega from Spain, William Buffett from Berkshire Hathaway, Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook, Carlos Slim um, from Telecom in Mexico. Those are the multi-billionaires at 50 billion plus. Forbes lists 2,047 billionaires for 2017. These global capitalist elites are fully aware of their vast inequalities and their rapidly growing concentration of wealth. The billionaires are similar to colonial plantation owners. They know they are a small minority with vast resources and power. 
Yet they must continually worry about the un unruly, exploited masses rising in rebellion. Understanding how power and inequality is sustained can perhaps give us opportunities for democracy and equality in today's world. Now, there's a long tradition of sociological research that documents the existence of a dominant ruling class in the United States. Elites set policy, determine national political uh, priorities. It, the, the American cl upper class is complex and competitive. It perpetuates itself through interacting families of high social standing with similar lifestyles, corporate affiliations, membership in elite clubs, and, and private schools. The American ruling class has also been, long been determined to be mostly self-perpetuating, maintaining its influence through policy-making institutions such as the National Association of Manufacturers, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the Business Council, the Business Roundtable, the Conference Board, the American Enterprise Institute, Council of Foreign Relations, and a number of other policy groups that are U.S.-oriented. These associations have long dominated policy decisions in the U.S. government. In 1956, uh, C. Wright Mills wrote his book called The Power Elite, which was how World War II solidified a trinity of power in the United States that comprised corporate, military, and government elites in a centralized power structure motivated by class interests and working in unison through higher circles of contact and agreement. Mills described how power elites were those who, quote, decide whatever is decided of major consequence. In the past few decades, especially since 9-11, the policy of the elites have been mostly united in support of American empire military power that maintains a repressive war against resisting groups, typically labeled terrorists, around the world. This war on terror is much more about protecting transnational globalization and capital, dollar hegemony, access to oil, than it is about repressing terrorism or protecting us. The U.S. has a long history of interventions around the globe for the purpose of protecting our national interests. In, in, increasingly, the, the NATO is a partner with the U.S. in this global dominance agenda, reflecting increasing transnational economic natures of our interests. Now, when we say national interests, I think it's important to kind of specify what, what does that mean. Robert Blackwell, who is um, a Kissinger Senior Fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations and National Security Advisor to George Bush, clearly stated in an article in January of 2017 telling President Trump the importance of defending the U.S. interests. He wrote, in addition to protecting the U.S. from nuclear threats, Blackwell called for ensuring the viability and stability of major global systems, trade, financial markets, supplies of energies, and climate. He said, we must maintain a regional and global balance of power that promotes peace and stability through domestic, um, with, through domestic American robustness, an international policy of primacy and supporting defending the U.S. alliances particularly with Israel. Now, so he's saying, we're here to protect business. That's what it's about. The Heritage Foundation has an annual index called Military Strength, and it describes U.S. vital interests as defense of the homeland, successful conclusion of major wars or destabilize a region of critical interest to the U.S., and the preservation of movement within the global commons, the sea, air, and other space domains through which the world conducts business. So the, the, the empire, the American empire, and the NATO empire are about protecting business worldwide. Peter Dale Scott writes in his book, The American Deep State, he describes the importance of Wall Street as the overworld that offers intelligence agencies and personnel around the world policies and direction. The U.S. Has, has long been the protector of global capitalism, especially since World War II. We have over 800 bases in 70 countries and territories. The U.K. and France and Russia collectively have only 30 bases that are foreign. We are now, the U.S. is now deployed in 70 percent of the nations in the world. And the Special Operations Command has troops in 147 countries. Um, 
an 80 percent increase since 2010. U.S. Special Forces are currently engaged in 100 missions in Africa. Most of these missions are training exercises, but direct action counterterrorism strikes happen regularly, including drone assassination and kill and capture raids. Capital power elites exist around the world. The globalization of trade and capital brings the world elites into increasingly interconnected relationships to the point that scholars for the past few decades have begun to talk about the development of a transnational capitalist class. One of the earliest works on this topic is the book The Transnational Capitalist Class by author Leslie Sklar, um, economist at, in London, argued that globalization has elevated transnational corporations to more influential international roles, with the result of nation states being less significant than international agreements developed through the World Trade Organization and other international institutions. Emerging from these multinational corporations is a transnational capitalist class whose loyalties and interests are still rooted in their corporations but are increasingly international in scope. Now deep inside the transnational class is what David Rothkopf calls in his book The Superclass, the global power elite in the world they are making. He is the one that talks about the one thousandth of one percent, the six to seven thousand people who the Davos attending, private jet flying, mega corporation interlocked, policy planning elites of the world, people at the absolute peak of the global power pyramid. They are predominantly white, mostly from North America and Europe, and they are the ones that set the agendas in the G20, the G7, NATO, the World Bank, and the WTO, World Trade Organization. Now, in our research, we identify the people on the boards of directors of the top 17 asset management firms of the world. These firms have an in excess of $1 trillion in management. These 17 firms collectively have 199 directors on their boards. We think that this group of 199 individuals represents the financial core of the world's transnational capitalist class. Now, if you look at the chart on the back of the picture I gave you, that's the back of the cover image. There's a chart there that shows you what we call the giants. When I say giants, these are the corporations that manage in excess of one trillion dollars in 2017. So many of them are far in excess. They're four, five trillion, four trillion, three trillion dollars. And the total for those 17 firms is 41.1 trillion. They're only managed by 199 people, so a room twice the size they could all fit in and have cocktails. It's not very many. Um, they are, <clears throat> and what's interesting about these, they're, they're the Western governments and policy boards work in the interests of this financial core to protect the free flow of capital investment anywhere in the world and the continuing returns needed for capital growth. The financial core of the transnational class are the directors of banks and the asset firms that control this $41 trillion. In addition, they also serve many other smaller asset management firms, adding traditional trillions of dollars and more. So if you look at the, ch the chart I gave you, it shows you the one with all the squiggly lines, the Global Giants Corporations. Those are the 17, and they control 41 trillion, and they're all invested in each other. So the 41 trillion, 403 billion, is invested in each other. So they, they're all collectively invested in that this, this 40 trillion dollars becomes one large, super connected global capital structure managed by less than, less than 200 people. And that's the power of elites today. Now, if you look at the back side of that chart, you'll see that the global, the $17 trillion companies, there's three more new giants that by 18, 2018, have been added into the trillionaires. And then there's nine near giants who are all in excess of 800 billion. 
So if you put those all together, we're talking about 30, 30 big companies that control in excess of $50 trillion worth of wealth. So we're starting to talk about a quarter of all the wealth in the world concentrated in one place. Now, if you try to think about a trillion dollars, I mean, it's, it's really kind of an amazing thing to even think about. The entire U.S. military empire and NATO together, uh, all the bases around the world, all the military wars and things we're doing does not exceed a trillion. So when you talk about 50 times that, managed by just a few hundred people, it's a massive amount of very solid, consolidated wealth that every government institution, every president, every president of European countries, every, all the intelligence agencies want to protect. That's what American capitalism is about, is protecting that wealth. The top asset firms tend to invest in each other. J.P. Morgan, Chase, and, the, and BlackRock, they have this $403 billion invested collectively uh, in each other. The interlock capital is likely much higher. It's probably closer to two to three trillion because that 400 billion that we've discovered was only about 25% that NASDAQ publicly lists in terms of co-investments. So 75% of, of these investments are held privately and we don't know where they are. So <clears throat> there are many hundreds of transnational capitalist people inside the global empire of capital, but these are the 199 that are the most part of the financial core. They manage the top 17 firms. They have similar backgrounds and similar training. The 136 of them, um, they're all degreed. 59 have MBAs or PhDs. Almost all attended elite colleges. 28 attended Harvard and Stanford. The people from the 20 nations are made up of the financial core. 60% are from the US. 23 are from Britain and France each, 13 from Germany and Switzerland each, then three from Italy, Singapore, India, Australia, Austria, two from Japan and Brazil, and then one each from Netherlands, South Africa, Zambia, Kuwait, Belgium, Canada, Mexico, Colombia. So it's international, and they all operate in the big cities like New York, Chicago, London, Paris, Munich, or went to college there, Tokyo, Singapore. The members of the financial core take active part in global policy groups. Financial core serve on as advisors to the International Monetary Fund, the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, the International Bank of Settlements, the Federal Reserve Board, the G7, and the G20. Most attend the World Economic Forum in Davos. Many of the, many of the 199 have been keynote speakers there. So, the, and the World Economic Forum get, has been getting more attention that we, newspapers will say when it's happening. Um, <clears throat> it's not a policy-making body. It's in Davos, Switzerland, January of every year, two or 3,000 people go. They, it's up at 5,000 foot elevation. They, they pay, um, this year I heard it was, was 50,000, it used to be 25,000, and the top 1,000 corporations in the world are invited to send people. And they can send as many as five, as long as one is a woman. So that's how they keep a, a little gender balance there. So, but it's not a formal policy-making group. There's an educational consensus function. So these thousands of elites in the world, 3,000 attended in 2017, um, they're getting to hear from top investors and top policy people in the world. The president of China was there last year. Um, and did, didn't Trump go this year? I think he did. Um, and so they, it's, it's very, personally, it's, it's very enlightening. And, you know, a lot of um, 
feeling of, boy, I'm really special because I'm here. I'm in Davos. Kind of the same thing I saw at the Bohemian Grove, where the 2,000 plus men meet every year. And it's just all men there. They don't even have a, a quota for women. And, um, but they don't make policy either. They just get together, applaud each other, hear talks and speeches, and, uh, uh, and feel good about it all. <clears throat> Transnational elites interact as a class of people. They know each other often personally. They do business together. And they either know each other personally or know of each other. They have similar educational and lifestyle backgrounds. They share common global interests. They meet in non-governmental policy organizations and form new ones as needs arise to privately make decisions for global governance institutions to implement. Transnational elites hold a common ideology of being the engineers of global capitalism, a firm belief that their way of life and continuing global capital is best for all humankind. The transnational capitalist class represents the interest of several hundred thousand millionaires and billionaires who comprise the richest people in the top 1% of the world's hierarchy. So you may be a multimillionaire, but most of your money you've, been, you've, you've been allowed a, a management investment firm to, to hold for you and give you anywhere from a 3 to 10% return. And if you have some that's risky, you may go with a venture capitalist company in the hopes of getting better than a 10% return. Ironically, this extreme accumulation of concentrated capital creates a continuing problem for investors. They have to scour the world for new investment opportunities that will not yield adequate return, that will yield adequate returns on capital. So they got more capital, they got places to, to invest it in with a positive return. The concentration of wealth and power at this level tends to overaccumulate in the hands of increasingly fewer elites to the point that capital has limited safe investment opportunities. There are three mechanisms for, for investing this excess capital. One, they'll do risky financial speculations like the subprime mortgage loans, which almost collapsed the entire system in 2008. They will continually buy up public institutions and try to privatize everything, electric companies, water, roads, schools. I'm waiting for churches to become privatized. Well, in some ways they are. And so all, everything that's part of the public domain, all, everything in the culture is for sale. And the other big area where capital is used up is, is the preparation for war, and, the act and, and wars. So wars, they spend huge amounts of money um, investing in war machines, war protection, armies, and then they blow things up that have to be reinvested and, and, and protected. So it's a very great profi profitable way to use capital. So Western governments and international policy bodies serve the interest of, of the transnational capital class capital concentrations. Wars are initiated to protect their interests. Uncooperative regimes are undermined and overthrown in support of the free flow of global capital for investment anywhere the returns are possible. So we've seen regime changes and attempted regime changes in Libya, Iraq, Syria, Venezuela, Yemen, Afghanistan, the Balkans are all examples of wars to support international capital penetration of the region. There were some blockages before by dictators or government blockages, and that they're seeking to undermine that. And they're seeking very hard to dismantle the democratically elected countries in uh, Venezuela, and Cuba for that matter. Um, and earmarking and surrounding militarily China and Russia now, the Chinese have some 80 billionaires, and they, they are invested in, in this market, and they are part of the policy planning thing, but they still maintain separate military and, and, and nationalistic orientations that don't, the power elite don't like very much. So while millions suffer, the, the, the power elites, the financials, they, they focus on seeking returns in the trillions of dollars 
And they'll do this on speculating everything, like food and land. So, and they'll cooperate with each other to control and entrap, and this controls and entrap cycles of economic growth with continuing mass humanitarian consequences. So if they're investing in bulk foods, uh, the commodities market and the prices are going up, for somebody living on $2 a day and the price of whatever commodity they're eating, rice, potatoes, whatever, goes up, that leads to the continuing starvation of tens of thousands of people every day. So war in preparation for war is a major return use of excess capital. For the U.S., that amounts to $600 billion in 2017. It's higher this year. China is $215 billion, Russia is $69 billion, but Saudi Arabia, UK, India, France, Japan, Germany are all in the $40, $50 billion range. South Korea, Italy, Australia, Brazil, Israel are all in the $20 to $30 billion range. So Dwight Eisenhower said in 1953, every gun that's made, every warship launched, every rocket, rocket fire signifies in the final sense a theft from those who are hungry and are not fed and those who are cold and not clothed. The post-9-11 wars continue to reap havoc and death in the Middle East, Africa, and other regions. Over 180,000 people died in 46 conflicts in 2014. 65 million people are displaced refugees from 2017, fleeing war and famine. And these wars are not just the results of military adventurism or political conflicts, but are motivated by propagandized ideological fears of terrorism, the desire for profit and military investment. Lockheed Martin takes the lead with profit making in war with 36 billion spent in 2015. The perpetual war on terrorism is good for business and the transnational capital investment people invest in these companies. So in the book I researched and I found out that Lockheed Martin if you look at the 17 giants, State Street has 15 billion invested in Lockheed Martin, Capital Group has 12 billion, Vanguard 6.5 billion, BlackRock 6 billion, Bank of America 3 billion, Bank of New York Mellon almost a billion, UBS 900 million, FMR Fidelity 700 million, Morgan Stanley 700 million, all of them are invested in Lockheed Martin. All of them are invested in Northrop Grumman, with State Street taking the lead at, at $5.9 billion. All of them are invested in Boeing, with Vanguard taking the lead at, at $11.9 billion. So these companies, these big war-making companies that make profit from war, are highly invested in the, by the centralized capital uh, giants. That's, that's where it is. They also invest in Coca-Cola, by the way. And, of course, Coke is the number one cause of diabetes and, and sugar consumption in the world. And they put out 1.4 billion plastic bottles a year, of which just a few percent of them are ever um, recycled. And they continue to do that. So the giants have, have no conscience in terms of where the money is invested. It's just wherever it can be the best, the best returns. So if we think about <clears throat> part of this is that the ultimate crisis of humanity, short of a, of a global nuclear war, is also environmental degradation. Scholar David Ray Griffin asks in his book, Unprecedented, can civilization survive the CO2 crisis? Since pre-industrial times, the temperature has risen 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit, causing significant changes in our world's weather. Just 100 companies have been the source of 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions since 1988. So the people causing this are a very small number. 100 companies. There's a 30-year lag between, it's actually, it's a 10-year lag between CO2 emissions and temperature changes. So what we're putting out now, we'll see the impacts 10 years from now. The rising temperatures mean a continuing worsening of weather events, extreme storms, record-breaking heats, 
colds, fires, tidal surges, heavy death rates, and financial losses. We will see massive fresh water and food shortages. All of this will be in our future if left unchecked. Global capital is a primary contributor to those problems, and they invest in all the things that are making it happen. Actually, the financial money managers study the transforming environment for new investment opportunities. Climate change investing can be profitable, according to Forbes Investing, and getting in on low-carbon investments and uh, should climate change stress increase, investments in defense, health, property insurances are all good ideas, Forbes thinks. Increasing interest in new mining opportunities available due to global warming in Greenland and places where the ice is melting back. And private investment in the control of water sources is seen as an increasingly attractive opportunity for capital investment. The most important issue for the transnational capitalist class is protecting capital investment and building opportunities for future returns. If protecting the environment is profitable, then reinvestments are acceptable. What remains unacceptable is the spending of money on people, the environment, and services that do not benefit capitalism. This lack of concern for human betterment in, in, in <clears throat> intended or not is the core con contradiction of the transnational capitalist class and the true tri crisis of capitalism today. Our research focuses on transnational policy groups that are non-governmental. These organizations unite the, the transnational elites as a class. The G30 and the Trilateral Commission are privately funded, staff-supported research organizations, whereby TCC elites can speak openly on global capital and security issues, moving towards a consensus of, of understanding on needed policies and their implementations. These meetings offer the transnational elites opportunities to personally interact with each other in face-to-face, -face, off the private, off-the-record settings that allow for personal intimacies, trust, and friendships to emerge. These interactions are the foundation of the transnational elite class consciousness and social awareness of their common interests. We think that the group of 30, the G30 it's called, is a private nonprofit group based in Washington, and the Trilateral Commission, the two together having 86 elite members in their management teams, are essentially the, the central core of policy planning process for the world. Both are nonprofit corporations supported independently from government funding and any regulations that for them, and they open up the discussion of global capital and security needs by people with common class and financial interests. Twelve of our $17 trillion company investment firms have one or more representatives on either the G30 or the Trilateral Commission or both. Goldman Sachs has four directors on the core of the transnational policy group. The most important part of, of private policy planning organizations is, is that there's no government control or oversight. These are elites meeting together privately, often off the record. They will issue reports that are read very closely by the World Bank and NATO and others, but the, the G30 is, is one in particular. They have, and, and they describe themselves as, they aim to deepen the understanding of international and economic financial issues and to explore the international repercussions of decisions taken in the public and private sectors. The G30 is a highly influential institution in the area of global finance. G30 was founded in 1978. Reports from study groups make, made up by the top bankers, financiers, policymakers, and academics. These reports are widely accepted and usually implemented around the globe. The G30 is a nonprofit corporation funded by Rockefeller Foundation and now receives close to a million a year in donated funds from various private sources. A G30 report in October of six, 2016 on oil and global economy reports how the U.S. fracking technology has changed the industry, making the U.S. a global exporter of oil, resulting in lower prices and destabilization of the Middle East and North African countries. We call those MENA countries, Middle East and North African countries. The report calls for the MENA countries 
to build more diversified competitive economies because we're selling oil cheaper and they're not doing so good. Um, and the report calls for strong leadership because the regions need bold and creative governments will show the way for the youth and new entrepreneurs, encourage private initiative, and change attitudes from idleness and dependency to diligence and self-reliance. They said that right in the report. So in other words, if you're not a bold and creative government, upgrading your idle youth and complying with global capitalism's investment opportunities, you are likely to be replaced with an externally supported regime change. I mean, it's, it's just, I mean, they just come out and they say this. The 32 of the G30 policy directors are deeply connected in the transnational institutions of central banks. 12 are from the US. One US citizen has dual citizenship with Israel. Three are French, three are French. Two are from the UK, both from the House of Lords. Two directors each from Germany and Mexico, including the former president of Mexico. One director each from Poland, Canada, Spain, Argentina, Italy, Brazil, Switzerland, Japan, India, Singapore, and China. Highly educated group, 16 of the 32 hold PhDs. They have 30, 31 of them are men and there's one woman, Gail Kelly, who's from the Australian Bankers Association. She's also worked the International Monetary Fund. She's the only woman in that group. Very, very powerful group. I mean, when they put out a policy plan, it's perceived by the World Bank as a direction to what to do. And so, you know, the Bank of International Settlement, their members are all linked into IMF, the Bank of International Settlements, the World Bank, the Basel Committee, Financial Stability Board, the G7, G20, WTO, and the Federal Reserve here in the U.S. These are very powerful people, and they all meet in one place privately, put out reports, and we have zero input into what they're planning and thinking. All 32 members of the G30 have been keynote speakers at, at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Of the seven, 17 most co connected um, money management firms, the, the, there's six that are directly on the board of directors of those from the G30. So the G30 brings together 32 of the most powerful people in the world. They are essentially the executive committee of the policy core of global capitalism. They can formally develop policy recommendations outside of government oversight. They organize behind the scenes study groups with other TCC elites. And they provide an international understanding of policies needed to protect global capitalism and continued growth. They focus on security, and it's safe to say, as a financial, the, the financial executive committee of the transnational capitalist class. One organization, very small. The other one that's far more international is the Trilateral Commission. This was founded in 1973, and it brings together unofficially, without government oversight again, the highest level group possible to address important international problems. Originally, the representatives were from Europe, U.S. and Japan only. In later years, representatives from around the world. It started in 73 with Rockefeller funding. <clears throat> Currently, there are 375 members from 40 countries, 87 from the U.S., Germany has 20, France, Italy, U.K. have 18 each. The Asian group has 100 members, and the remaining 124 from countries all over the world. Each country has a quota and can nominate people as openings become available. Members take formal positions in their government, they're asked to step down. So you're, the formal members, if you're in government, you're not in, in the Trilateral Commission. Trilateral Commission is business executives, mostly men, but there's, there's a good portion of women there, um, who are setting policy privately. Um, they, they issue regular task force reports. The, Task Force report in 2013, 14 was entitled Engaging Russia, a Return to Containment. The authors were former U.S. Undersecretary, a, P a Polish Prime Minister, and a former Japanese Ambassador. The report was prepared in 2013. Multiple consultations were held in Mexico City, Manila, Krakow, Washington, D.C., and at Harvard. 
The report expressed concern that the Russian invasion of Crimea, and invasions is in quotes there, because the Russians didn't really invade Crimea, they already had bases there. And that was an agreement with the Ukraine government for a long time. Putin was described as being, bringing about a ruthless break with the West. Under Putin, Russia was not contributing to global stability, but rather aspires to be a superpower. U.S. business leaders are concerned about the anemic growth and economic climate in Russia. Concerns with Putin and the topic of his removal were clearly uppermost in the minds of the trilateralists. The TCC business elites are salivating over the opportunities Russia's vast economic resources offer for capital investment. Now, under Yeltsin, when, when, the, when the wall fell, and under Yeltsin, we did do a good bit of investment in Russia. We still have great investments there. But Putin has reasserted the government's control over the country. And so our capitalists are not as free to invest all over the world, and it requires government approval. So they're, they're literally thinking and trying to put, a, you know, regime change in the U.S. in Russia as a primary agenda for what we're trying to do. That's why you've seen so much negative press in the U.S. corporate media about Putin and Russia. It's been constant. And the whole, they've interfered with our elections, and we did that to them a long time ago. But, you know, everything they've done, it's, it's almost there daily in our media or on our t television news. So that everybody's got this really negative, the Russians are bad, the Putin's bad, and, and it's been deliberate. The global corporate media are owned and controlled by the transnational capitalist class. Their primary goal is the promotion of products and pro-capitalist propaganda, propaganda through their psychological control of human desires, emotions, beliefs, fears, and values. That's what media does to us. Corporate media does this by manipulating our feelings and our cognition of human beings worldwide and promoting entertainment viewing as a distraction to global inequality. Corporate media receives two-thirds of their broadcast and print content from public relations and propaganda firms. It's not like all the news people are out there gathering news, they'll go cover the local wreck or what's happening at the jail, but when it comes to international policy issues, it's coming out of public relation firms, meaning that nearly all content for global capital media today is a prepackaged managed news opinion or entertainment. The big three global <coughs> public relation firms are WPP, Omnicom, and Interpublic Group. I have a whole chapter on this. They get $35 billion a year in revenue, and they have total hegemony, of, and they promote the total hegemony of capitalism in the world today. There can be no alternatives. Public relation firms and their corporate media partners serve corporations, the government, and non-governmental organizations in an unrelenting ideological assault and the pacification of the minds of the masses of the world. So the people living on $2 a day, they're trying to convince them to smoke cigarettes and drink Coke. I mean, and it's American tobacco. The overall messages are the encouragement of the continued acquisition of material products and consumption, expanded desires for a life of luxury, fear of others, terrorists, criminals, threatening people, the support of police states, the acceptance of permanent war on terrorism, and the equation of private corporations as an essential element of democracy. This is what Noam Chomsky called engineering opinion and parading enemies. And now, an important world policy planning group is the Atlantic Council. The Atlantic Council is a nonprofit organization established in 1949 as an alliance from people in the countries of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. The stated goal was to build policies and institutions towards collective security and peace against the Russians. Ideally, that was what it was about. And they have an annual budget of 20 million, and 74% of their funds come from contributions um, from private, private grants and, and private corporations. The Atlantic Council produces numerous policy reports, books, and papers. The U.S. NATO military security issues are a high priority for the Atlantic Council. So this is another policy group that has 146 elite members in it that are setting the agendas for military action and security issues worldwide. And countries pay attention and follow them. 
These 146 elites come from 28 countries on the, on the board of directors. Among the listed directors are four former NATO commanders, 13 representatives from major defense contractors, including Boeing, Raytheon, Bechtel, Lockheed Martin, BAE, SAIC, Carlisle Group, Bruce <coughs> Allen Hamilton. 11 directors are current or former military generals or admirals. 41 directors are active in government or private security, including the National Security Council and various public and private security policy groups, including cybersecurity. And also on this, on this board is G4S. This is the international security company, the second largest employer in the world with 650,000 people, but it's a private security people. Those are the ones with the dogs up in the Dakotas that were attacking the people trying to prevent the pipeline. So private mercenaries and private military companies are increasingly a part of war and manipulations in the world today. Global capital management and the protection of concentrated capital is a top priority for the Atlantic Council. On the 40 individuals of the board of directors, <clears throat> 40 of the individuals on the board of directors were connected with capital investment management firms in some way. They were all very high in various large capital corporations. People on the board of directors, six were in the corporations of our 17 listed in our core group. They are the financial management investment firms from all over the world, and their job is, is to protect security for global capital. So we have, in the book I break it down, we have the managers of global capital, that's 199 folks that um, are on the board of directors of the 17 giants. Then we have the facilitators of capital. Those are the people on the, the Council of 30 and the Trilateral Commission who facilitate, make policies for capital's free flow and investment with no interference from governments anywhere in the world. And then we have the protectors of capital, that's the Atlantic Council and their use of the military intelligence, NATO, and the U.S. military empire worldwide to protect capital investment and its free flow. <clears throat> and when the U.S. NATO military empire is slow to perform a face, or faces political resistance, that's when private security firms and private mercenary companies are increasingly filling the, the elite's demand for protection of their assets. These protection services included personal security for executives and their families, protection of safe residents and work zones, tactical military advisory and training of national police and armed services, intelligence gathering on democracy movements and opposition groups, weapons acquisitions and weapon systems management, and strike forces for military action and assassination. Private companies are doing that. We are privatizing war, and the capital elites are invested in that. Over 200 billion a year is spent on private security, employing some 15 million people. G4S is the second largest private employer with 625,000 people. They earn $10 billion a year in 2014. G4S works with Chrysler, Apple, Bank of America, and Nigeria. They, the G4S counterinsurgency operations protect Chevron pipelines. They've undertaken similar operations in the South Sudan, provide surveillance for checkpoints. They help manage prisons in Israel and security for Jewish settlements in Palestine. G4S offers security guards, alarms, management, and transportation systems, prison management, and electronic offenders in 120 countries around the world. So the US NATO military empire is the police force for concentrated national capitalism transnational capitalism with a few hundred individuals and that control tens of trillions of dollars. The core agenda for the global empire is protection of capital growth, the elimination of barriers and restrictions to the free movement of capital. The TCC shares an interest in ensuring capital growth and open opportunities for investment worldwide and is the driving force of capitalism. Global policymaking thereby becomes an important transnational function formation of transnational capitalist class made up of persons with shared educational experiences, similar lifestyles, common ideologies, is rapidly becoming an essential component of global capitalism today. Institutions with capitalist countries, including government ministries, defense forces, intelligence agencies, the judiciary, universities, and representative bodies all recognize to varying degrees 
that the overriding demands of transnational capital reach beyond the boundaries of nation states. The idea of legal boundaries for nation states has long been held sacrosanct in the traditional liberal capitalist economies. However, globalization has placed a new set of demands on capitalism that requires transnational mechanisms to support continued capital growth. Worldwide is increasingly beyond the boundaries of individual states. The financial crisis of 2008 is an acknowledgement of the global system of capital under threat. We see these demands as allowing for the abandonment of nation state rights altogether by occupations, wars, trade, trade agreements, and enforced economic rules. <coughs> Failed states, manufactured civil wars, like in Syria, regime changes, direct invasion of occupations are all manifestations of the new world order requirements for protecting transnational capital. The global power elites understand the need for transnational agreements and international mechanisms in support of capital expansion and growth. They are very rapidly building organizations to support um, transnational capital and bring together elites in the, from every region of the world. Knowing who exactly they are as core players in the world is an important part of understanding about what needs to be done, which is the book we list, 389 of them. And it's not too late for democracy movements to divert this onslaught of concentrated capital growth, but rapid adjustments are needed very soon if we value our human rights and democracy. So that's that. I have time for a few questions or comments if you would like. Was that just too much to take in? <laughs> it really is quite amazing. I mean, um, most people don't realize the degree to which capital is so concentrated in the world today and how few people control it. I mean, this, that, can't, that concentration is bigger than governments. Governments are paying attention to protecting the capital in a very, in a very big way. Yeah, Tim. Not, not very well. That's a, that's a very specific question. It would take a long time to try to explain it. Um, trans part, you mean the Pacific Partnership? Yeah, yeah. I think we're still trying to move in that direction, but it's all about keeping capital, the free flow of capital, going and investments happening. Without, without trade barriers and that. So I'm still trying to figure out what Trump's doing with the steel industry, other than internal political stuff. But um, <clears throat> if he does too much of that, he's not gonna be around very long. Because it's really Wall Street that's, that's, that's setting those up and making those plans. So, um, <clears throat> but getting, I mean, and, but what we're seeing though, too is, is in Davos they worry and they talk about the precariat. And the precariat is the working class people who are, in, are haven't, aren't doing as well. And they're the ones that voted for BRITX in, in, in England. And um, so they're standing up and revolting. So now we're trying to figure out how do we deal with middle class people voting. And, and in a way that explains how Trump got in. Because he was not the choice of, of, the, of Wall Street particularly. He got through, but the best thing he did was get them the tax relief they wanted. So they saved billions and billions of dollars. Now I think they're starting to think rather seriously, and he put together an advisory board of 15 people originally, and they disbanded after some of the stuff he said last summer. So <clears throat> BlackRock board, uh, Chase Manhattan, Jamie Dimon, um, they're certainly have second thoughts, but their idea is that, well, he's the one flying, he's the one flying our airplane right now, so we have to support him. But, uh, I think if the airplane flies too far one way or the other and their impacts are happening, we'll see some kind of impeachment actions happen pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah, is there much of a, is there much of a difference between multinational corporations and the uh, transnational uh, economic elite that you're talking about? Well, the elite are, are people in managing investment capital. Transnational corporations get a lot of, invest, a lot of money from those sources. So, you know, like Coca-Cola, I mean, massive amounts of money come from those investment management firms. 
to go into Coca-Cola or, or American Tobacco or, or the auto dealerships. I mean, yeah, multinational companies, they need to have money, they need to have people invested, and increasingly, it's not you and me investing in them unless you're in a pension plan that does a little bit of that and CalPERS invests in all of this stuff too, um, which is my pension plan. But um, we don't have any say about it. And the impacts, the negative impacts that is happening environmentally and in, in, impacts in terms of increased wars and, and uh, regime changes, it's just, it's just incredible. It's, it's an awful manifestation. And the sooner we understand this, and we can really relate to this and, and address it as the 99% and demand our democracy, um, that would empower us. And I think that social movements scare the hell out of them. So multinational corporations could be part of our democratic movements if we can kind of support them? Because they Certainly individuals them. within multinational corporations. There's in, I mean, we write a letter at the end of the book. 90 local folks have signed this letter. Um, and we're saying, look, look, you guys. This isn't working well. You know, the, yeah, the top 20% are getting wealthier, but the 80% aren't. And this will ultimately lead to civil wars, unrest, destruction, environmental right, riots, that sort of thing, and environmental collapse, and financial collapse with you guys, because you don't have places to invest all this money. So let's figure it out. Let's do something. Let's turn what, what you call a trickle down into a river of resources that's going downward into the coffers of every human being on this world and pulling them out of poverty and, and adjusting. It wouldn't take that much. Um, they are the ones in power to do that, short of massive civil wars and revolutions. And that gets pretty terrible. So, but they are, they are capable, and we have to find the ones that support that kind of activity, encourage them, have social movements that really stress the inequality, and, uh, and it doesn't matter what we, what, what it is. I mean, social movements are happening around a lot of different things. Um, but ideally, it would be an um, Occupy-type movement where people are in the streets in massive kinds of ways saying, we want um, the concentration of wealth stopped, we want billionaires stopped, we, can, we want to tax their money, you can be a millionaire, we'll let you stay you know, wealthy, but uh, we want all those resources put into humanitarian purposes for the world. And they could, they could, relative, they could do it relative, with public banks in every city. You could uh, take the top 10% off of, off of the, all of this growth investment and pretty much fund every family in the world to, to a, level, a, a level of human survival and humanitarian that meets the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Yeah. I think the short answer is no. <laughs> and even, even when they do, I mean, you know, Bill Gates says, I've given away $40 billion. Yeah, but you get to decide where you give it and what you give it to. And you've been putting money into trying to privatize public education. I mean, that, that's, that's, no, that's not okay. We're going to have to um, tax or take it away from them in some capacity or, or force them to release that so that it goes to all human beings in the world. And this isn't just one country, we're talking global here. And I've got to go meet, have dinner with Ralph, so I'm, <laughs> I'm on my way. Thank you very much.